I'd like to welcome Miss Debbie Siegel, my poet of the East today. And for those of you who wonder what direction she is in Earth space, to my mind, every poet is a sunrise. They are the East when they bring us their wonderful art. So Debbie, welcome to Poets of the East. I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you so much, Rick. It's really my pleasure and honor to be here. Well, I have a series of questions that I like to ask my poets. And if any of these strike you as inappropriate or not quite something you want to get into, that's fine. Just say so and I will veer away. So question number one is a, is a toughie. Um, when did you start writing? When did you kind of really find art writing as, as, as something you got joy from? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. I remember completing my first novella at the age of 10. Oh, and cool. Yes, I even still have the um, the manuscript written in pencil on lined notebook, uh, you know, binder paper in a binder. I remember sharing it with my best friend at the time, and she um, she gave it great feedback. Um, and so it was it was something that I. Oh, wait a minute. Even before that. OK, when I was in second grade, I remember doing a version of Exquisite Corpse with a friend. Only it was fit, it was prose. She would write a portion, and I would write a portion, and we keep trading. And like we were literally little goth kids at the age of seven. We didn't go around dressing in black or sleeping in a coffin, but the pieces we wrote were so dark and so like what was wrong with us? We probably needed years of therapy, which I guess we subsequently got. But it would be something like. And then so-and-so pushed her down the stairs and she landed on the scissors that so-and-so had put there. I mean, what? I don't have any of those pieces, but they, they're they kind of seared into my memory. So um, so writing was always a, a really good creative outlet for me. I think um, my mother hated messes, so she didn't encourage a crafting room or you know a bunch of stuff where you would really have to leave your messes out for a few days while you worked on them but with writing a pen and a paper was something you could just easily close your your binder and get back to it very cool very cool yeah i i uh, i guess when i was eight i got a little tape recorder and i would go around and do interviews and <laughs> and write little stories on it so yeah i I started young too. Okay, next question. When you were in this young age, you know, just kind of exploring the idea of writing, were there authors who impressed the young Debbie? Well, there's another like piece number two of how young I was when I got started. I was um, really fortunate to benefit from a thing called California Poets in the Schools. And I don't know if that's nationwide. No, I guess it's just for, for California. So they were just starting that up in the 70s, and I was one of the first cohorts where um, I guess a poet, and my particular poet teacher was um, the late John Oliver Simon, very important to me, like my first poetry mentor. I guess they would either pull kids out from class in the seventh and eighth grade, or maybe we opted for it like an elective or a club. I'm not sure how that happened, but um, I, was, I became one of John Oliver Simon's uh, poet students. Oh, and cool. not, yeah, not only were we doing it within the classroom, he then, um, you know, gave us the option of doing workshop at his home. So we would on Wednesday nights, I think it was Wednesday or Tuesday nights, five or eight teenagers would meet in his living room. He would oh. give us, a, yeah, oh my God, it was amazing. He would give us a prompt and we would like lay on our stomachs on the wood floor, you know, or whatever, like we're young, we're writing. And so um, that was really important to me because I was heading down like a juvenile delinquency path at that exact same time. So it was like, I was literally a little tiny, like Neil Cassidy. I was like literally going on hot, you know, rides in hot cars with my friends <laughs> and writing poetry about it. And so I was like edgy as all get out and wow. like I was actually writing about it. So, um, and, and we were in the beat lineage at that time because- sure. We were here in the Bay Area. My teacher was rubbing elbows with um, the beat poets. And uh, I think I got to meet some of them because it's a little hazy because not only were the grownups smoking a lot of weed, but the teens were. But 
we definitely got taken to a um an event a happening a be-in or something at this one poet um uh, mary norbert curtis property in uh, rural california which if you mention that name to people who are beat aficionados they're like yeah 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 and so I believe I was crossing paths with like Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg, but I was so busy running over to the where my friends were, or maybe some boy I had a crush on or something that I wasn't sure. like running around with a microphone interviewing like, oh, you guys are world, you know, world famous poets that I'm in the same like festival with. So we were all there. We were all like being influenced by each other. And um, so does that answer that? I could go on and on and on. Stop me for the next that's, you, you answered the next three questions automatically. <laughs> uh, when did you start performing poetry? Uh, what authors did you lead, were led, leading you to insight? Uh, did your teachers help? Those You've already asked and answered those. Those are great. Wonderful. Yeah, we weren't really studying other poets. We were really just exploring our own muse, which was really amazing. And so then what happened, um, I was, like I said, I barely scraped, yeah, got out of high school, got out of there somehow. Berkeley High was um, making it easy for troubled kids to graduate at the time. My counselor who had followed me through junior high was like, you have so much potential. You know, we're going to have to like squeeze some units in and like get you out of here because this Berkeley High School isn't really um, isn't really the place for you. So I did graduate from Berkeley High School a semester early, which makes no sense because I should have been like held back or something. And then I really enjoyed um, going on to community college where I was able to focus on theater and dance and stopping nukes and all kinds of things that were just pertinent at the time. We even blended those things together, right? Oh, the yeah. Oh, theater, yeah. The guerrilla theater and all that stuff. And so I was able to really get um, figure out what my direction was. Hilariously, like my direction was going to be poetry. And we have San Francisco State University where I was like, I'm going there. I can write poems. They can get me graduated. And my my pals that uh, that were at the community college, like, why don't you go get a degree in journalism, Debbie? Like, or advertising. You need to like have a real like job. Like, what is it, this poetry? And I'm nah, you know. So I just followed my own direction. Like, luckily, a job a job fell into my lap, which was. Um, library paraprofessional. So I was able to, you know, thank the gods and goddesses that that was the job that fell into my lap and not like sandwich maker. So I was really able to just um, keep working throughout, you know, teenage, college, young adults, got, you know, got my pension out of that. So that's why I'm able to be really so productive now is I, I'm retired quite rather quite early which was in our contract we were able to do I was kind of like I need to get out of here now because I'm going to end up being fired and lose my pension or something like it was just getting so you know the things they say about civil service are oh, kind of yeah. really true like civil service jobs would just be so wonderful but they have to make it like not wonderful otherwise it would be absurd to have a wonderful position with wonderful management and be feeling wonderful <laughs> So, um, so yeah, hence uh, at about the age of 55, I got out of there. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Well, when I talked to, when I talked to the pension guy and he goes, well, you'll be making X amount of money per month for the rest of your life, not to show up. And I'm like, that's kind of like the amount I make now to show up because <laughs> I, had worked, I had worked like extra hours one year and they took top year. I spiked my pension without even realizing it. I thought I was helping out with substitution because they were keeping me sort of starvation level. They kept me at half time all those years. The contract was really good, except it had an, a weakness in that there wasn't a, um, you know, a, um, what would you call it? A language that said first in, first promoted or first in, first gets extra hours. So as a paraprofessional, all of us were stuck with half-time work. And I think they were just hoping people would just use it for their college job and get the hell out of Dodge. But um, most of us were like, no, this is really, really neat. Uh -huh. to stay here. So you would try and put moonlighting into it. So most of the time we'll moonlight it at bookstores. So it's always been books and it's always been like 
really, I've actually re- met some amazing authors due to the amazing like bookstore I worked at as a young woman to moonlight for my, my part-time library work. I moonlighted at um, Shambhala Booksellers on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, which was a world-renowned uh, metaphysical and Buddhist bookstore out of which Shambhala um, publications came out of. So I was like, learned so much about Buddhism and all kinds of other metaphysics. And then when that beautiful store closed down, I got to be, I got to participate in the closing ceremony where I got to be in a really small, like dozen person circle in which Michael McClure was reading. Wow. Oh, oh, and things nice. like that. So there you have it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've had some wonderful experiences in those kind of bookstores. Yeah. Uh, just to regale you with with one, mm-hmm. uh, I had been intrigued. Uh, well, I was thrown out of the Catholic Church bodily uh, for for questioning some things uh, at, at my class's confirmation. Uh, I was thrown out of class so often that I hadn't heard part of the ceremony in our church. And I understand it's not every Catholic church, but it was in ours, that you kiss the bishop's ring. Okay. Now, I hadn't heard that. So I'm standing, I'm an S, so I'm at the end of a long line. And I'm watching these people that I've grown up with kissing this guy's ring. Now, his aura sucked. Okay. His aura really sucked. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute, what part of Jesus is this? You know, Jesus was washing people's feet. He wasn't saying, bow down, kiss my ring. That wasn't his thing at all. And then the same thing, my my inspiration, my my mind was showing me pictures of Tom Jefferson and Tom Paine. And I'm going, wait a minute, we don't do that. We don't, you know, we don't grovel to princes. We don't grovel to clerics. No, that, that, no that's not what we do. And I'm trying to reconcile this. And I'm saying, you know, my 12 my year old mind is going, okay, look, Rick, Rick. You can't explain this to anybody. Sit down and shut up. Just go through the motion. It'll be over in two seconds. Just freaking do it. Well, when it came my turn to do it, um, I shook his hand instead of kissing his ring. Now, it didn't please him at all. So he puts his hand in my face and said, kiss it. Well, even if he hadn't said that way, I wouldn't have done it to save a soul. So when I shook it again, he literally in front of the entire congregation and about 12 of my relatives said, get out of my church right now, pointed to the door. Well, it, needless to say, it put a bit of a cramp in my confirmation ceremony, a uh, party afterwards. But long story short, it put me on a path to study comparative religion. So I, I swore to my angel I would read every religious book I could. So I've read about six different Bibles, the Koran, the Upanishads, the Book of the Dead, Egyptian and Tibetan, lots of stuff about Native American work. And uh, I, I, I said to myself, why is it that we say we only use 10 percent of our brains? But there's got to be some people who look into this. You know, this, I can't be the only one asking this question. So as I began to look at that, I started studying meditation and uh, different ways of what we called psyche development. And back then, as I was getting out of school, this was these early 70s. So there was all kinds of meditation groups and yoga groups and psychics around and, and astrologers and all that stuff. And I, I'm a double Virgo. I'm like hyper skeptical. So I wouldn't really want to do the scientific. So I had a journal and I was taking notes and I was interviewing people. And I came to understand from my reading, from my studies, from my meditation, that um, the, the roads are all very, very similar. They, re, they produce the same kind of results. And so, so that put me on a path. But the, the short, quick story about the spiritual stores, there were dozens of them in the early 70s. And they had opened up a new one in Denver. I was living in Denver at one time. And I decided I would try, uh, I had read about uh, a, a Hindu, excuse me, a Muslim prayer technique where you would do a pilgrimage. And in this pilgrimage, you would say a prayer and then prostrate yourself say a prayer and then prostrate yourself and do this all the way in your pilgrimage. And when I told my friends I was going to do this, we were going to I was going to go about 10 blocks, partly through suburbia, partly down the main street of Denver, Colfax. And my friends are going, Rick, are you crazy? They're, you're going to be arrested because, of course, you know, I'm wearing long hair and, and the whole thing. And I said, no, 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 I, I got an excuse. They're like, well, how, how, what? I said, number one, you're coming with me. So when the cops stop, and they will absolutely stop, you're going to tell them that this is a initiation ceremony for my college fraternity. Ah. And they go, ah. 
that might work. Well, of course, they stopped and it did work. So I do this all the way to this occult bookstore, right? And literally, I had attracted a crowd going down Colfax, walking into the store. And of course, my hands are bloody, my knees are bloody, because yeah. I've been doing this for a while. And the bookstore owner says to me, what do you want? You clearly came here with a purpose. What is it you want? And I said, my brother, if there is a way that I could borrow, there's a book that I would really like to read, and I'll be glad to take very good care of it and, and bring it back when I'm done. I want to read the, a, a book referenced in the Book of the Law called The Sacred Book of Abramel and the Mage. And I said, I really want to read this. And he said, brother, it is yours. And he gave me this $75 book. Mm, but enough I'm about me. Goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps. No, that really resonates for me. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. No, yeah. that's that's the that's the way I found out about Neem Karoli Baba and all the important things that led me to be way yeah. more developed than I would have been. Yeah. So, okay, next yeah. question. Now, poets vary across the spectrum, but there's one school of thought that says write every day, write every week, whatever it is, write all the time, whether inspired or not, just write because then you'll polish your craft. The other school of thought, and it's equally valid, is write only when you have inspiration. Don't force it. Just go with the flow. Write when you get it. Don't write when you don't get it. And, and I have appreciation for both. I fall in the first school. <laughs> I was wondering, where do you fall? Are you a person that writes all the time for practice, or are you waiting for inspiration? Well, I call myself, uh, I have impulsivity issues. And so like, but here's the thing is, I have to wait until impulsivity hits, but it does hit. And my muse and my impulsivity do work together. And so I'm also a slightly different um, creature than, than a poet, because I'm a publisher also. Like I have to do project only for myself. Like if I was your publisher, you would be rattling my cage going, what's the, what's, what's going on? I'd be going home. Well, the impulse hasn't hit me to do the table of contents yet, Rick. Like gotta wait until like the impulse hits me and then I'll let you know. So uh, it's fortunate that I do my own also because yeah, if someone else is my publisher, I'm, I'm telling them like, I don't like that font you've selected for us, you know, so it's kind of good. So the impulsivity, somehow I found a way to use my impulsivity control issues or not my um what is it called uh my high impulsivity that like when you're a kid you you don't make good decisions but now as an elder I'm able to when I have that impulsivity you know I might be up all night like finalizing something you know that sort of thing so I don't do the writing practice every day like I gotta write it unless I'm involved with that thing called the nano rimo which actually I did couple of years back and I and I did the every day in the month of November you hit your your goal is a word count about about 1800 words a day and you're you're going to complete this giant manuscript by the end 50,000 words out of which some people are able to get a novel and so like that was that was the one time I got the experience of writing every day it was real interesting. I did. I was able to produce a um, ten thousand word novella from that process, and so, so I understand that process, and that's. I don't dismiss it at all, and I, I may actually join the Nano Rimo again. Um, but yeah, it's it's really odd that this process that I have that is only, I'm only able to get things done if I freaking feel like it. But yay, I freaking feel like it enough to like get a lot of production. Okay, next question. Are there topics that you find yourself returning to again and again? Yeah, kind of themes, I guess. I guess, um, hmm. Yeah, I do. I find my, well, themes or whatever, like I, I'm in, I haven't been into any confessional writing until recently. Like everything was always languagey. Like I come out of the school of language poetry, which like my mentor, Mel Thompson, I always love to mention Mel in my, um, in any interviews, like he's, he's a confessional poet. He's a rant poet. And he, 
was always on me like why don't you stop with these cut ups and these cross outs and this blah, 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 and write some crap about your life like you've had really interesting adventures and misadventures let's hear the confessional poetry and i was i just couldn't or something so um finally like now i've i've crossed that that bridge and i can um definitely use my own life experiences coupled with my imagination and uh, create writing of that sort, which I think is like way better than just the language poetry. But, um, but that's my that's my lineage, so I can't really dis dis them. But um, so then so then confessional poems and writings are more part of it all. Rants have become more a part of it all. Um, my themes are kind of metaphysical. Like you you've heard me read. There's some kind of like what is going on? I guess the the audience will be like, ooh, oh, ooh, what? Mm, so it's not me ranting about like mis my miserable relationship or my this or my that, which by the way, I don't have. I have a beautiful partner at this point. But you know, like a lot of ranting is um very personal. So I can I can kind of rant or do confessional poetry that is more, I guess, universal or something. So so yeah, kind of metaphysics is always in there. Um um uh what do you want to call it entheogens or something that has always interested me um no it's a term i'm not familiar with would you explain what entheogens oh it's it's another word for psychedelic oh, drugs okay. and sacraments okay. or something and Absolutely. if you didn't if you didn't know me or if you just knew me from my writing you'd probably think i you know take it every day or something and i i don't but i'm just really interested in it and i'm interested in my characters exploring it or my writing, exploring it. Um, I've done pretty judicious about it, as it turns out. I, um, you know, I, I like consensus reality a lot. Or I, when you go to some place that's like kind of like, what is this? And you get back to consensus reality, it gives you a great appreciation for it. Um, I guess what I'm alluding to is this thing called salvia divinorum, which is even like legal in smoke shops. Whoa, that broke things open. I had a very interesting introduction to psychedelics because I was so interested in states of consciousness. I was reading Tim Leary when he was still at Harvard, Dr. Lilly with his dolphin experiments. And, and this introduced me to the concept of exploring consciousness and altered states. So I had read about this before it became a popular topic. And I had had done a lot of journaling and research in the topic because it was to me it seemed to be very much part of that leading edge of mental development how do we develop different senses enhance our senses and stuff like that so i had read all this stuff before i ever tried my first trip and consequently with set and setting if you've prepared yourself properly if you have the right set and setting i never viewed it as a recreational experience I viewed it as a consciousness exploration and ultimately a spiritual experience. So I found myself um, by and large in the early 70s as a trip sitter who was sought out to help people through difficult times, difficult situations. And I, I thought, how can I fit what I'm interested in into a college format? So I thought anthropology and psychology. But I found the classes that I was available that were available to me were so 1950s oriented that the psychology professor I had was saying, I'm going to show you a completely objective, nothing but the facts, ma'am, uh, film about drugs. And he showed the same claptrap that I saw in 10th grade where you know the guy took LSD and dove out the window, he you know smoked marijuana and became a rapist. And I'm just, I said, excuse me, sir, it would be one thing just to show this junk. That's, that's one kind of insult. But to preface it, saying that it was scientific, that it was objective, that's, that is really beyond the pale. I said, I would like to request time to do an alternative presentation because there are many serious intellectuals who have explored consciousness alteration with great results. And this is completely it leads to really wrong-headed thinking about the whole topic. He said, Richard, come see me at the end of class. I came to his classroom at four o'clock as he had suggested, and he had the police there. 
And he said, Richard, let me introduce you to these officers from the county sheriff's department. I've given them your name, phone number, and address. They'll be dropping by to see you on a regular basis. So, and I said, you know what? I won't be back in this building until I'm invited back to lecture. And you know what? Within a year, I was invited back to lecture on the subject of meditation. Oh. And then I got, I got a chance to lecture at University of Miami, Florida International University. And I was told by the head of parapsychology at University of Miami in anthropology that he had never heard as clear a description of the techniques of meditation and a better explanation in his, this is like a 60 year old and I'm, I'm barely 22, right? He's, I've never heard a better explanation of meditation and how it works, the, the, the physio-mechanical part of it, because I, I combine the thinking that when you do make the mechanical process of chanting, the mechanical process of pranayama acts to regularize the frequencies of our consciousness, and therefore we start to sense those overtones that are the subtler kinds of consciousness. And he went, that's phenomenal. They they actually hired me to do a series of lectures at University of Miami. And, and the, the head of student activities who's hiring me says, Richard, uh, we can probably pay you $500 a lecture. Would that be adequate? And I was about to say, oh my God, that's completely unnecessary. I would be honored just to do, and my wife, who knew what our budget was, rams me in the, in the ribs and said, that'll be fine. Perfect, good on her. No, that, that that's amazing. That's amazing. You probably, you were probably rubbing elbows with people who, whose books I have on my shelf, you know, like Charles Tart, um, Robert Anton Wilson. Absolutely. I was actually friends with their kids and all this because Berkeley was just epicenter of consciousness. Absolutely. Stuff. And I had a chance to meet Ram Das in, in the most perfect way. I was teaching in yoga classes and, and pranayama, kundalini yoga. And he, he came to town, he came to Miami of all places. So I, I told my people and I said, you know, listen, I, I'm going to go. If you want to go, we're, we're, I was teaching from Be Here Now. I'm sure you know the book. So, oh, yeah. so I said, we're going to go and I'm going to, well, I'm going to go and you're welcome to come along. So we all go down there. And our local occult bookstore, the day we heard that it was, for, the tickets were for sale, they sold out that morning. And I said, well, look, is there any chance that there'll be more tickets available. Oh, absolutely. They're definitely going to keep some at the gate. Don't worry about it. No problem. So we were down there at 9 a.m. for a one o'clock lecture, right? And we start chanting Om, building up some energy. So we're standing there and this, the line begins to grow, right? And we're chanting Om, we're chanting Om, we're chanting Om. And then a dear friend of mine who went by the name Om Susanna, who just got back from Arizona, she had spent some time in the sweat lodge scene and she brought back a big bag of peyote. She said, Rick, would you like some peyote as you're going to attend the Ram Dasta? I said, absolutely. It sounds marvelous. So we're chewing peyote and chanting Om, waiting to get in. Well, when the ticket seller shows up, they said, we're really sorry. We wanted to save tickets, but there was such a demand. We sold every ticket. I'm really sorry. And my, my students are going, Rick, that sucks, man. I mean, you brought us all the way down here and like it didn't happen. I said, listen. Amazing things are possible. I'm going to stay here and chant Om right where I am. Now you're welcome to stay with me. Is, is, is it a guarantee? Absolutely not. Nothing. Nothing is guaranteed. But I think if we sit here and chant Om, something amazing just might happen. So we're chanting Om, we're chanting Om, chanting Om. They open the door. Everybody goes in. We're still chanting Om. And sure enough, coming down the sidewalk is a tall figure in a saffron robe. Ram Dass stops where we're chanting Om in a circle. And he said, you know, I've been greeted a lot of nice ways in a lot of nice places, but this is really wonderful. Thank you so much. You've got a really good vibe going. And he joined us with some Ohms. And he said, all right, now let's go ahead, go on in. And we said, sir, seems that we're going to be stuck out here. There's just no more seats available. He said, well, look, let me go in and see what I can do. He goes in, disappears for a few minutes comes back out and he's got the manager in tow and, and the manager shaking. He said, no, look, I'm sorry. You know, they can't, there's no place for these people. I'm sorry. Ram Das goes, you know what? I think I know you people come with me. We sat on the stage with him during his sets. I knew you were on the stage with him. That was exactly where I knew you guys were. Oh my gosh. 
I got a I got a Ram Dass story, but it's actually a Bhagavan Dass story. Please, please. Bhagavan Dass was in this house performing Kumari Puja for my kid. Wow. In this house. My wow. my life, because of knowing about Neem Karoli Baba, Maharaji, I went to a yoga um, studio one time because I had heard Bhagavan Das was in town doing curtain. And I went and I was just sitting there going, wow. And he was so personable and just delightful. And we all hung out and talked afterwards. I talked about my daughter. He talked about his granddaughter. Another mother came along and he said, you know what, Debbie, I'm in town for a few nights or whatever. I'm coming to your house on Tuesday night. We're going to do a puja for your kid. And it did. We did. We had hundreds of red roses. He sat there and strung them into garlands. We had incense. We had a puja in this very house that changed me and my daughter's life just so much. Like we were, we were hurting. Like there was difficulties going on spiritually with us, but he blessed us so, so amazingly. And a couple nights later, we were all together again in another woman's house in Berkeley with for puja for her daughter so i was like pals with baba for a while drinking wine smoking weed dancing it was it was raucous and like he's the um the black sheep of that movement or something people don't really get what he's doing but he um to me he was the most genuine and authentic um you know spiritual teacher and it was like literally when you're ready for the teacher they arrive on your path. It was just exactly that way. And furthermore, I had to show him this toy that I've still had since I was two years old, which is a um, a monkey stuffed animal, kind of like, but the face is like human. And I go, here, Baba, I have been, this has been my Hanuman. I have been loving Hanuman since I was a two-year-old. And he says to me, you are the mother of Hanuman. You are Anjani. I literally had that experience in my life. And wow. so I, you are one of the few people that understands that because you you studied um, Be Here Now. So yeah. you saw yeah. the images, you saw the stories that Baba, Bhagavan Das, was actually going to be Ram Das. And then he wasn't. He was like, no, nah, it's not going to be you. You'll, you'll be Bhagavan Das. And let's wait until actual Bob, you know, Ram Dass shows up. So this stuff is real. It's so, I can't explain it. It's ineffable, sure. but it's, it's important. So, wow. Well, I have to tell you one more story. It, it's it's, it's okay. too much on the tip of my mind. It has to be shared. Um, dear friends of mine were part of the organization called the East India Foundation. And they would bring teachers from India. They happened to be uh, musicians, classical American musicians, but they were also trained in classical Indian techniques. So they would bring dancers over and musicians over. And at one point they brought the Tibetan sacred music, sacred dance show, which you may have heard of. They brought it to Miami. And at one point I was asked because I had a background in television production and was trained as a video editor. They said, would I, would I videotape the show? And I said, oh, okay, L let me explain something to you. This can't be done on a shoestring. This can't be done with like somebody's home camera. This has to be done with the respect that this is due. This is the Dalai Lama's house band, okay? This is his dancers. This is, you know, this is like the Met, the Met is coming to your office. Please respect it. They go, no, no, no problem, no problem. No, well, you know, you can rent a camera and you know, do what you need to do. I said, please, please. Just I will I will be glad to donate my time, not a problem, but don't ask me to shoot this with somebody's home camera. It's just disrespectful. Okay. Well, needless to say, what happens the day of the show is they hand me not just a home camera, but a home camera where the magnifying lens is busted off. So I've got to look at the little tiny screen on there. And I said, My dear friends, really, this is completely inappropriate. Long story short, they had a satsang afterwards. Okay, so I, I shot it. But the satsang afterwards, you have to picture, you know, you know what spiritual groups are like, you know, 
many very well intentioned some they're there for the fun you know they're there for the social god bless them they, they make progress eventually too but anyway so so worth his sad saying and it, they man they they did just an exquisite meditation for us and then he said okay look i'll take a few questions so it turns out that when this group of monks traveled dancers and musicians traveled from tibet they brought them into California, and the first thing somebody did, how they thought of this, I don't know, they took them to Disney World. Okay, anyway, so they said, okay, now you've been traveling in America. This was the first question asked. You've been traveling in America now for like four months. You know, what's your impression of America? And he had to be looking out at this group of um, yuppies, to put it simply, yuppies. And he said, well, in America, you have a lot of things. I hope it helps. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the, no. the reaction of the crowd in general was, what do you mean by that? That is so profound. <laughs> I hope it helps. <laughs> it doesn't help though. We must admit it doesn't help. Well, I mean, every things. spiritual teacher has warned us against being the trap of materiality, so you figure it out, you know. But anyway, let's let's get back to this. Uh, my dear, sometime we have to spend a little more time talking spiritual matters. It is yeah. an honor, an honor yeah. to meet you and get to it know you. Really, really wonderful to hear about your background and how it uh, intersects with some of the things I've been wondering about. Okay, next question. Um, how do you feel? Uh, do poets have a responsibility to address contemporary issues? No. I mean, okay. poets do not have a responsibility to anything other than honoring the muse. Good answer. Good answer. Okay. Now, if a young person were to come up to you and said, you know, I write a little poetry, but I don't know. Is it something I should really do? I mean, is it worth anything? Is it is it worthwhile? What would you what would you say? Is poetry worthwhile? Is poetry worth spending life moments in? I would probably tell them in a kind of joking way, I would probably say something like this. Well, I was doing poetry since I was 14 and poets in, you know, California poets in the schools and our poet teacher was making a living as a poet. I'm not sure how. And he encouraged us that we, you know, that was our role model. And I, and then I, I would somehow segue into, but in further conversations I've had with some of my colleagues from that cohort, we have said, damn, man, why did John encourage us to get our MFAs? He should have told us to get our MBAs. So like, I don't know, I would just have to have like a little anecdote without actually telling someone what to do. But um, poetry was doable when rents were a hundred dollars a month. We need to, so some other people that believe that poetry is has to be informed by politics, they need to be bringing it so that the you know, universal basic income can hit and so that caps on rent can hit so that um, you know, socialized medicine, socialized checks, socialized daycare can hit so that artists can do what they need to do. But if I was, going to be the mentor of young people i would have to you know i would have to give them both sides i would have to do some critical thinking with them about what they ought to do and so like i don't know that's not really an answer it's more of a um you know in my experience magically somehow it worked magically i was somehow able to put food on the table and keep a roof over my head and work as a civil servant and I don't know if it's, it's, I don't know if the times are magical anymore. So that's a disappointing answer. And I'm a little disappointed in myself for not being able to speak, but poetry is worthwhile. So what do you need to do? Get a sugar daddy? I don't know what you need to do to be able to contribute your poetry, which is so worthwhile and um, take care of your, you know, basic needs on the pair on the needs pyramid so 
I don't have answers. Like I am a person that believes poetry is worthwhile to answer that part of your question, like more than worthwhile. A lot of us will, um, I've noticed this past couple of years, a lot of us will say, honestly, poetry has saved my life. And that's a, that's very worthwhile. Absolutely. So, I don't know if there's a yes or no answer to that, right? That's yeah. perfectly fine, dear. Okay. Hearing your thoughts alone was wonderful, okay? okay. Last okay. question. And this is another one that, that there's no correct answer. There's just, I want your answer. Is narrative important or necessary for a good poem? Hmm. I guess not. I mean, I'm not a professor at all. So, I mean, I'm feeling like I'm just thinking poems have landed on me that were not narrative. So that I've really enjoyed. So I guess like the answer to that would be no, would be no. I mean, that's the language poetry school where mm -hmm. um, images, feelings, sensory, you know, details and mystery can land on the audience and they don't understand what just happened. So I guess no. Well, this has been such a marvelous voyage. I am just inspired very much. Now we get to the fun part. Now we get to hear some of Debbie Siegel's work. My dear. Thank you. Whatever you'd like. Have fun. Okay. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to see. I have no background behind me, so I'm able to show a picture of a book. This was um, this was the play that I inserted myself into beat legend and lore because I wrote about beat legend and lore, and it t it got a little it got my name out there a little bit among beat aficionados, and I was um being a little bit controversial because I was looking at uh, a situation that happened in 1955 and I came up with my own take on it. Um, so people could do their further research, but I had learned about Natalie Jackson, who had been a girlfriend to Neil Cassidy in 1955, who um, met her end one night suddenly in the um, care of Jack. Kerouac. He did not perform very good fellowship that night in my research that I had done. She was a footnote in history, so I wrote the book. Of course, it's fiction. It's drama. I wasn't there in the room, but I'm just going to read a little bit out of that first. And it's called uh, Natalie's Story, A Rain Check for Jack Kerouac by Deborah C. Siegel. And since it's a play, I'll do the format of using the person, the character's name, and then this their lines. Jack. Neil first met Natalie on canvas at Robert Levine's studio on Goff Street. Robert was working on Nude with Onions of Peter Orlovsky around the same time. Huge naked youth. I brought Neil to this redhead in the painting he dug. He's been blasting away with her then and thereafter. Natalie is one gone chick, very sensitive. Now, it seems Carolyn, the sweet wife of Neil, who is not truly a saint, if you ask me, hasn't wanted to blast with Neil for some months. The redhead set up housekeeping with Neil, a warm body and a pretty face to come back to after the break station. Selma, you talk about Natalie as if she were not even here in her own pad. Natalie nods. Jack, no sweat. On another topic, Alan rented a cottage for $35 a month across the bay in Berkeley. Selma, by Berkeley U? I hear that he and Gary Snyder are doing Tantra and other experiments with sex and mind. The orgasm that never ends. An oral tradition passed from Vince. Give me some oral. <laughs> Jack, I ought to take up Alan's invitation to flop over on Milvia Street. There's a garden. Oh, and Radio Free Berkeley KPFA says we can record and broadcast whatever we want. Get Gary to read and McClure. Vince, go man, go. 
Jack starts to put on his shoes. Jack, I'll babble about it when I get back with the wine. Vince, I'll go. I got shoes on. Selma, hang on. I got this one. Jack, those aren't shoes. They're sandals. It's raining. You buy, I'll fly. Come in, Clellan. Selma, you and I are here to cheer Natalie, Vinny. Like Neil said, Jack's wanting for wine just won't quit. Clellan Holmes, Jack, before we go, I have a personal rant for you, Jack. I wrote my novel, Go, Jack, and how many reworkings and reshapings did I go through before that book was ready to be a book? Rhetorical question. You know I was in that process for a year. You wrote On the Road in one paragraph about 120,000 words long. It took you three weeks. Hell, if I, I, I was one of the first readers. I read the goddamn thing on teletype paper. You hadn't even read it yet. But you know that I did what I promised you. I showed it to my agent. My agent took it on and they sent it to Viking. Viking said, maybe. Maybe? God damn it, Viking. This is John Kerouac, the man who got Town in the City published. A second novel isn't supposed to be another first novel. Oh, God, Jack. Why can't you write something written in a style that can get you published anymore so the world, the regular people, can understand what you have? Jack, you know it, Clellan, better than anyone. This generation is a beef generation. That's that. And then I learned to publish my own work with a very experimental book of um, monologues called Borderlands and Lines, which I brilliantly thought of getting some illustrations from a friend of mine, John H. Seabury, who had been sharing a lot of his sketchbooks and I'm like, I've got these weird pieces and I would like to have some of your art to go with them. And he said, sure, fine. So we collaborated on that. By the way, that first piece was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a really short, it's a short um, play. It was a little too short for the theater companies. They wanted it to be fluffed out a little or put together with another companion piece. We did get a, um, a podcast of it um so there's there exists a wonderful not a pot a live um radio show we did an entire redid the thing with um bbc sound effects so like it, it, it's available and I'll, I'll send you that link also really great talent read the parts and all that really great I'll send talent. You one of my radio shows too excellent so this one was this weird thing this project that i was involved with at the height of the the, the pandemic, you know, the shutdown where actors didn't have work and playwrights didn't have work. So we would just, this guy would send out a prompt and we'd shoot these. And the whole point was to just do them quick. It was called quick fire. So we'd shoot these one to three minute monologues out to this group uh, Google document and actors would, would do them. And so it was a really fun project. And I ended up with many pages of work and I decided to use that as my first experience self-publishing so that was fun and this one is um, called trusting the turn this character is a poet sitting at their writing desk musing about literary terms and devices nowhere is the haphazard strangeness of veering more evident than in literature veering turning the volta in poetry the volta or turn as a rhetorical shift or dramatic change. Ciardi called the turn a fulcrum, while Rosenthal speaks of both gentle modulations and wrenching flips of emphasis or pitch. Lazare calls it the swerve. Whatever one terms it, it's the crucial element in poetry, introducing possibility, transformation, I'm writing this particular piece right now, and the turn is the center, not the middle, the pivot, the keystone of this particular piece. A moment of grace, where this piece veers from the questioning to the being in the presence of. 
I trust the turn, correcting mid-course. Today, I am going to trust the turn even if it pulls the rug out from what I'd established, even if the meanings I had assigned must be reconsidered, even if I must concede territory, transgress boundaries. I will leap in and over, breaking the surface from silence to sound like a dolphin. So there's that. <laughs> And now this year, I was like super productive. I published a novella back in February, and I was very happy with the reception of that. Some people aren't into poetry, but they do like fiction. And this is called, oh, I can tape this. This is not for sale. Take that off. And this is called Edwin in the Embrace of Entropy. And I was really pleased with how this turned out, both um, the content and the aesthetics. I got advanced praise from a guy named Jonah Raskin, who I met being that I had written about Natalie Jackson, and he had written about Natalie Jackson one time at a book fest. We just met, sat on a park bench, and had an entire Natalie Jackson love fest. It was like so perfect. He's a real professor. He's a real book reviewer. He puts, you know, real poets have their books and it's like, and Jonah Raskin liked it. And I'm just mm -hmm. Debbie Siegel. And I reached out to Jonah and said, can you like blurb my little book? And he did. So that was, that was quite a thing. So I could walk around with this and people will go, oh, Jonah liked her work. That was super helpful. Congratulations. So, thank you. I'm going to read just the beginning of this to give people who, if they're interested, like kind of like what's going on. So, <clears throat> Edwin in the Embrace of Entropy by Deborah C. Siegel. It's near the end of February 2012 on unceded Ohlone lands, known as Berkeley, a name more associated with a public research university than with an Anglo-Irish philosopher. Barbara Ann Dunn, a middle-aged anthropology department librarian in red high-top sneakers, shivers in the twilight in front of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. student union, people watching after work. On a bench across from her is a bizarre old man wearing a French beret and beaver coat, preaching to half a dozen juggalos sprawled on the grass around him. Not often you see people wearing fur in Berkeley. She wipes her round tortoise shell eyeglasses and puts them back on. A juggalo she knows is coming out of a grove in the heart of campus, walking her way. Ninja Patches and Barb broke the ice that summer she volunteered at the free clinic. He used to beg with a cardboard sign saying, spare change for threads. She's given him money here and there over the past year. He sews rhinestones and flower appliques on his baggy cowboy style suit. What's up, sis? Want to pitch in for a bag of shrooms? Barb's been asking around on Telegraph. His eyes flash from under grease-painted lids, and he grins. Barb pulls a 20 from her wallet. Hell yes. She puts the bill down between them. I don't want a micro-dose, mind you, but I don't need a hero's journey either. You a cop? He asks. Nope, bro, a librarian. She looks up at him and shakes her head. He picks up the 20 and lopes towards People's Park a few blocks south. I shall return. A damp breeze blows and the humidity makes 60 feel like 50 degrees. She buttons her cotton blazer's collar up to her chin and looks at her watch. She glances over at the old guy in the fur and beret, coveting his coat and hat. The group of young people in grease paint and baggy clothes are hanging on his every word. And I'll leave it at that. So there's Very also nice. a glossary. There's, there's illustrations by my daughter. And this is one of Campanile, which is our clock tower in Berkeley. Very nice. Clock tower, the clock tower is a character in this book. This book actually, if you look at the Tarot Major Arcana, and I didn't do yeah. this on purpose, oh, every yeah. one of the every one of the archetypes 
almost in the exact order is in here and I didn't try. And so I'm like, that's why it's good. It really just pulled in a lot of archetypes, including the tower. Very and nice. My work that I'm currently um, like slinging is called In the Time of the Cloud. And that's just a full on <clears throat> chat book. It's not an experimental thing at all. It's poetry and it's got a beautiful wraparound cover photography by our um, esteemed colleague, Frog Corpse. And I'll just read nice. a couple of pieces out of it. <clears throat> I do recall after Charles Baudelaire. I've forgotten a lot from those years, but I do recall our little white bungalow in the flatlands between the waterfront and the foothills, in particular, the garden sculptures, Venus, goddess of love, and Pomona, goddess of fruit, hiding in plain sight in an orchard of fig, olive, and ginkgo trees. One couldn't make out the form of those wabi-sabi plaster of Paris statues unless one had mapped out where they stood, obscured by leafy limbs, figures scraped and worn from winter storms. I still remember massive solstice sunsets creating fractal rays, beaming splintered light through our bay window pane, glinting like Sabbath candles on our small Ikea table. We'd eat in silence, not that we were angry or bored with each other. We were mostly speechless, mainly amazed at the spectacle of that flaming round sun gazing into the room at us its glow, transmuting those $2 flea market curtains into brocade and transforming a bowl of chopped ramen into a gourmet feast. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. And this one is called Time's Arrow. Time's Arrow? Okay, so this is one of my themes. Like, I don't know what to call it. Time? It's one of my themes I keep returning to. Time and what it's all about. I get tired of people saying, let things take their course. Things trend toward entropy, energy dispersing, dissolving, and devolving. Somewhere, someone is making a mistake. Furniture is getting dusty. Relationships are ending. Observing a steam engine chugging, and you wonder, where does the heat go? Energy of the universe is constant, and entropy tends to a maximum. Each passing moment brings changes. Sequences completed, things getting done, and once done, never getting undone. Imagine stirring a spoon of jam into oatmeal and making raspberry trails. Imagine stirring the spoon backwards. Trails don't reinstate as a blob again. Entropy is the difference between what happened and what is to be. Time moves forward and binds us to echoes. Each moment is a fading flash of future. The past is forevermore, generating the now, uncertain and boundless into mortality. And maybe just one more that's kind of like that. Around the year clockwise. August fog washes away July smog and September dust spills on October hay. Crashing into November hallway come the December bells and hell if it isn't another January. Polishing the February diamond, March sequences the April rain, listening for the May bees. June swoon will soon be hewn. So that's Very what I got. Thank you so much for letting me do this. It, it was my pleasure, my friend, my pleasure indeed. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Debbie Siegel, poet extraordinaire, woman of no small wisdom. <laughs> Thanks again, Debbie. And uh, you have a wonderful evening. I insist. Oh, you are more than welcome. And you do the same, Rick.
Thanks Thank again. you, listeners, for giving us your time. Okay. You have a good, and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.